Now, getting back to Lazarus, we discover that a few verses later, we realize how long Lazarus would have been sleeping the sleep of death if Jesus had not raised him from the dead later on in verse 43. Because some people think that when Christ resurrected, Lazarus was going to go with him. John chapter 11, verses 23 and 24 says, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, understood the biblical truth about the state of the dead. She knew Lazarus wasn't going to awaken until the last day when Jesus splits the eastern sky at his second coming. The book of Job also mentions the length of sleep for the dead. In Job 14:12 it says, So man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Notice the word till in that verse. This means the dead will not or cannot awaken until the last day, as Martha calls it, in the previous verse. My favorite verse on this subject happens to be 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23, where it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Now, according to this verse, the dead in Christ will remain in their graves awaiting the order of resurrection. What is the order, you ask? Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept, and then those that are believers in Jesus will be made alive. But when will they be made alive? According to the Bible, they will be made alive in the order that the Lord set up Jesus the first fruits, and then those that are his followers at his coming rather blunt, is it not? So I ask, and I'm sure you do too, how did this lie get started? It's all in the punctuation. That's right, punctuation. Let me explain. The two short letters that I'm about to read to you are identical. Only the punctuation has been changed. Notice how you can perceive a totally different meaning by altering simple punctuation. This is a letter that a woman named Susan wrote to a man named John. I'm going to read it to you in the original format first. Then I'm going to alter the punctuation. Susan wrote, Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is all about. You are generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we're apart. I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours? Susan. And now I'm going to read the exact same words to you. Only now I'm going to change the punctuation. Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feelings whatsoever. When we're apart, I can be forever happy. Will you let me be? Yours, Susan. Now read Luke 23, 43 to get an understanding as to why I shared this letter. It says, in the original King James, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Is Luke 23, 43 really saying we go to heaven directly at death? Notice this. Jesus is crucified. Just before breathing his last, he tells the thief on the cross he will be with him in paradise. Then three days later, Jesus rises from the dead and Mary Magdalene approaches him. In John chapter 20, verse 17, And Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Why did Jesus tell the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, that they're going to heaven that day, and then three days later tell Mary he hasn't gone yet? Some say this proves the Bible contradicts itself. However, the fact of the matter is, many years after the King James Bible was written, punctuation was added to it. The comma in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, is actually misplaced. It should be placed after the word today. 
if it is left before the word today, it appears Jesus is being dishonest either to Mary or the thief on the cross. However, if it's placed correctly after the word today, he is now telling them both his truth, and no contradiction is assumed. Now let's read Luke 23:43 with the comma in the correct place. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise. One more thing to ponder in regards to this biblical fact. In John 19, verses 31 to 33, we find, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate, that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. Think about this. The sun is about to set. The Jews are wanting all the bodies off the cross before the high Sabbath day arrived. And a high Sabbath day, by the way, is when an annual feast day and a weekly seventh day Sabbath land on the same day. They break the legs of the two men. The thief on the cross is one of these men. But when they get to Jesus, they find that he had already died. However, the thief didn't die that day, did he? According to the worldly Bibles with the comma misplaced, Jesus said he and the thief would go to heaven that day. Yet Jesus went a day early, didn't he? The misplaced comma can now allow for a multitude of errors and so-called contradictions that Satan can use to convince billions to view the Bible as an untrustworthy book. The devil has been cunningly busy. That's why I love the Word of God so much. It so easily proves lies to be just that, lies. When you use the preferred biblical method the prophet Isaiah mentions when defining doctrines in Isaiah 28.10 where it says, Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. If you use that method, you'll never be confused. Letting the Bible define itself opens it up to a grand adventure into the truth. Psalm 89.48 says, 